for coming. This is our 11th speaker of term, and welcome to the Cambridge Union. Our guest today is Professor Manuel Hassassian. He has been the Palestinian Authority's representative to the UK since 2005, when he was appointed to that position by the President of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. Professor Hassassian served Bethlehem University for 25 years as a professor of political science, where he is the executive vice president. Please join me in welcoming him to the Cambridge Union. I didn't hear what you have said. That's okay. It was all positive. But I'm sure that you said nice things. <laughs> I'm happy to be with you here tonight. This is not the first time I come to the Cambridge Union Society. I've been here a couple times, but the last time I was here, maybe two years ago, when I was a little bit optimistic about the peace process. Sometimes, you know, we have, if we cannot be optimistic, at least we can be hopeful that, you know, a breakthrough might take place and uh, we might go back to the negotiations table. I know I don't have much time to telegraphically go with you down the history of the Palestinian Israeli conflict because it's only 20, 25 minutes that I have to speak and then open the floor for Q&A. You know, let me start with some general remarks about this conflict. I know you are educated, highly intellectual, being students at Cambridge University. I'm really thrilled to see that definitely you are well versed with issues in the Middle East, let alone, I mean, the conflict per se that has been going on for the last hundred years. We cannot negate the fact that the instability and insecurity in the Middle East have been a culmination, basically, to the non-resolution of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. This is a conflict that is referred to in political science as a protracted conflict. A conflict between two epistemic communities that have been struggling over the same piece of land. And they have been at loggerheads through a conflict of what I call a secular conflict. And this conflict has been molded by two factors actually, which exacerbated the compulsive violence along all these years. One, the factor of mutual fear, and the other factor is mutual distrust. The mutual factor and mutual distrust have culminated in basically creating a certain kind of a psychological, I would say, uh, problem, or a certain kind of a psychological complexity to this dimension of, uh, com to, to this conflict, which added it as a dimension that has not been catered or factored in when we talk about this conflict. In other words, what I'm trying to say is the fact that this conflict cannot be looked upon only sociologically, but it has to be looked upon psychologically and politically. So, I mean, if we put all the factors together, it makes it much more complicated to understand the nature of this conflict. However, you know, to simply tell you exactly how this conflict could end, by ending occupation. That is the basic premise to any kind of a solution that could be plausible to end the conflict, to end the claims, and to have an independent Palestinian state on the borders of the 1967, which means East Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza. However, what we have witnessed for the last 22 years, when the Palestinians have embarked on the peace process with that of Israel, and decided to make the painful historic compromise by signing to the fact that a two-state solution is the only plausible solution to this conflict. In 1988, as a result of our Palestinian National Council in exile, which represented the parliament of the PLO, we have made a resolution that only through political accommodation we can attain our political independence. So by de facto, we have accepted the two-state solution and we have accepted Israel to be the state of Israel over 78% of historic Palestine. So we have accepted that fact. Madrid peace process came in 1991 as a result of the Gulf War. Then we were embarked on this, what we call the Madrid peace formula and the Washington talks, 
that ended up in a total or dismal failure where Palestinians and Israelis have to create and be innovative through back channels in Oslo to have a breakthrough. And that breakthrough was made in 1993 when we have signed at the White House loan the, what we call the Oslo peace process. And the Oslo peace process was based on two stages. First stage is the redeployment of Israeli forces. The second stage is the building of the state. And in the meantime, Palestinians were supposed to build their infrastructural development and institutions of a state. And of course, you know what happened is during that period of time, the number of settlements have doubled, the number of settlers have doubled. The peace process was not really moving as fast as we anticipated. The redeployment did not take any place. I mean, you know, in the second re redeployment of Israeli forces, it was stopped. Then we started having suicide bombing. Netanyahu came to power, and in the final analysis, the entire peace process had wrecked until 2000, when Barack was the prime minister. And the Americans, you know, especially President Clinton at that time, six months left for him in office. He wanted to make a breakthrough. And uh, of course, they called for this important meeting at Camp David, which neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians were ready to go and make the rightful concessions. Needless to go into the details of all this is the fact that as a result of the failure of Camp David, we have witnessed the emergence of a second intifada. And this second intifada was completely different than the first intifada, which started basically in 1988 and ended up in 1991 with the, with the, with the of course, you know, the, uh, uh, the Madrid peace process. It was a different kind of, intif in, of an intifada, where it was a militarized intifada. And that militarization of the Intifada was one of the fatal strategic mistakes of the Palestinian leadership. I was, at that time, head of the Palestinian University, and I was a consultant, you know, to the PLO office in Jerusalem, and I was involved in the negotiation affairs department, and I said, it is wrong. We should not have played into the hands of the Israelis, because this is what they wanted. They want to derail the entire peace process, put the blame on the Palestinians, and by using firearms, we were in the wrong game. And actually, we have paid a very he heavy price where all West Bank cities have totally been destroyed after billions of dollars were, were pumped into, into the economy as well as into the constructions. So we paid a very heavy price, and since then, hell broke loose with the advent of Prime Minister Sharon, who unilaterally withdrew from Gaza and put Gaza under siege and embargo now for almost eight years. He just passed away, you know, after you know, a couple of years in being in coma, whom we have in power, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who comes on an agenda of settlement, building more settlements, isolating Jerusalem from the West Bank, waging two wars on Gaza, making the two-state solution impossible with the non-contiguity of the geographic locations of the Palestinians, if you look at the West Bank, it is divided into three major clusters of settlements that could in no way politically, geographically, make a sense for a two-state solution, let alone that Jerusalem has been totally separated from the West Bank through what we call the E1 envelope settlement process. And of course, Gaza has never had any land connection or sea connection with that of the West Bank. And we were supposed, supposedly, through the peace process, we should have that kind of land through what we call land swap with Israel. Where do we stand on the issue today? If you ask me a simple question, where do you stand on the Palestinian-Israeli issue, I can answer you very simply. Today we are stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. There is no way that we could proceed in a peace process when this peace process has never been based on mutuality and it has never been based on equality between two partners to the conflict when the third party, supposedly the United States of America, had to play an honest broker of peace, had not been playing that part as much as it has unequivocally been supporting, you know, the top dog over the underdog, i.e. Israel. 
So there were no negotiations per se between two entities that could claim certain kinds of rights. It was a diktat of power politics supported by the United States of America. That's why we have lost hope in the Americans for the last 20 years we have been believing that the Americans could really manage this conflict and find a resolution. But unfortunately, it has been managing the crisis rather than finding conflict resolution to this conflict. And that in itself made the frustration even higher when you don't see any kind of a balance by another power to that of the United States involved in the political process of the Middle East. So we have been, you know, actually as Palestinians pressing the fact that the UK, you know, one of the big powers in Europe, should take the avant-garde in trying more or less to bring up the position of the EU as far as their engagement in the political process. As you know, one of the major supporters to the Palestinians in terms of funding is the EU. Okay? But the EU has not been involved in the process. They have been payers rather than players in the political process. And that in itself, you know, make us undermine the role of the EU in trying to create that kind of a balance between them and the United States in the process, in the political process that we thought, you know, at one time that this will end up the occupation and we will have our independent state. It is so unfortunate that we have 140 countries in the world that have recognized the state of Palestine. Of course, in the General Assembly and not in the Security Council because America had always managed basically not to make any kinds of effort to encourage those Security Council members, the 15, and in order to put an issue on the table for voting, we should have at least nine votes out of 15. So we always reach the eight and never the nine because the Americans have always made it a point not to embarrass themselves even further by using the veto power. So by de facto, we never reached the Security Council because they managed basically not to let the ninth country to vote for us. And last time, our attempt it was Nigeria, which was part of the uh, uh, Security Council. And as a result, not to let Nigeria vote as a ninth power, so as we could put it on the voting, they had to bribe Nigeria with $2 billion of development. So this is the United States of America. Okay, now we're talking in the context of a total fractionalized Arab countries, where we have, you know, the Arab Spring, we have all these problems, regional, ethnic, whether religious or sectarian conflicts in the Middle East. We have an internal problem between Fatah and Hamas, which makes it even a little bit more problematic for us to have a united stand, especially on the political program and the forms of resistance against occupation. We have the apathy of the international community not to care about what is happening on a daily basis with the Palestinians. We have the constant building of settlements by the Israelis and constant desecrations of all our holy sites, let alone today what is happening in Jerusalem the last month is an outrage of desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque where the killings have been all over the West Bank under the pretext of stabbing and what have you, where the settlers have taken the law into their hands, supported by the Israeli occupation forces, where pillaging and raising and killing indiscriminately Palestinians and extracting their olive trees and orange groves and what have you with no impunity whatsoever. This kind of behavior, the mentality of a gun ho slinger mentality, is not really helpful, basically, in trying to create the conducive conditions for any kind of a rapprochement between the two parties. The irony of history is the fact that the two parties know exactly what is the solution, and they know exactly 
that there will be never a military solution to this conflict and that violence cannot really pay and it cannot really solve this issue. It is a waste of human lives on both sides. Of course, on the Palestinian side, it's outrageous. But when we talk about humanity, we talk about both sides. I think, you know, the sufferings of our people and that of Israelis should have been circumvented long time ago. Because we know that the road to peace is ending occupation. And we know the road to peace is mutual recognition. And we know that the road of peace should be supported by an international community that should care to understand and have a deep conviction that the Middle East can, will never be secured and peace and stability unless we have peace in our part of the world. It's not the resolving of the Israeli issue in the Arab world. It's the resolving of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in the Middle East. It's not a question of Syria and Iran and Egypt and Tunisia and what have you that led to the turmoil. It is not that today we are facing international terrorism. This, these issues did not come from vacuum. It came from the frustration of people. It came from the instability. It came from abject poverty. It came from the high illiteracy rates. It came from people who are humiliated and disappointed. It comes from people that are desperate because they cannot see a light at the end of the tunnel. And because they cannot see a light at the end of the tunnel, people become extreme in their behavior. And one thing which really makes me as a secular person afraid of the, of the of the continuation of this conflict and the exacerbation of this conflict when I see that this conflict is being totally transformed from a secular to a religious conflict. The religious dimension is very scary to me as a Palestinian. I cannot and will not accept my people to use religion as a way to end this conflict with Israel. And I cannot really accept the fact that Israel is trying and transforming this conflict into a religious conflict. When, when slogans of a Jewish state comes time and again in the political discourse of Israel, it scares me to death for the simple fact that there are 1.8 million Palestinians who are Israeli citizens and who are considered to be as third-class citizens. It means that the, an exclusive Jewish state, meaning that the expulsion of these people, the ethnic cleansing process that Israel is using through the confiscation of IDs in Jerusalem, is something that we have to reckon with. These are not signs of a government that really wants peace. These are not signs of a government that wants to have, once and for all, reconcilia reconciliation with the other side. This government is escalating the intensity of conflict by using the religious elements now. And you know, religion does not need to exert pressures to mobilize people. Two words, Allahu Akbar, in, 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 in Arabic, mobilizes all Palestinians to go down to the Al-Aqsa Mosque and, you know, submit themselves as martyrs by submitting themselves to God. They don't care about dying for their religious sites. I mean, why Israel is insisting on the issue of making this a religious war? We have to understand and bear in mind there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. There are more than 59 countries, Arab and Muslim countries in the world. If the dimension of religion plays an imperative role, God help Israel. I will believe that will be the beginning of the end of the state of Israel. I don't want to project, I still feel that there are certain ways in which we can get out of this complexity we can still go back to the negotiating table. 
we can still believe that the only solution should be a political solution. Nobody can claim or admit that this issue or this conflict is an economic conflict or it's a humanitarian conflict. No, it is a political conflict that requires a political solution. Without a political solution, and the parties understand the political realities, that they cannot make peace unless they submit to negotiations and help each other by this reciprocal mutuality of we are partners to the conflict rather than adversarial, we cannot jump from what I call the zero-sum game into what I call political accommodation and, and what we call, you know, searching for coming ground. It has to be very evident and explicit to all leaders in the Arab world and to the leaders in Israel that conflicts based on convulsive violence is a recipe for disaster. As I said, everybody knows exactly what the, social, the solution will be, but what lacks is the political will. And it is so unfortunate that today we are facing a crisis in leadership. A crisis in leadership in Israel. Just a few days ago, in Tel Aviv, they were mourning the death and the assassination of Prime Minister Robin, 20 years now. There was a man with a vision, and there was a man with a leadership quality. And he reminded me of my reading of history with Ben-Gurion. Those are the pioneers of the State of Israel, the pioneers, the leaders of the State of Israel. I believe, and as Yasser Arafat, God rest his soul, believes too, let alone many Palestinians believe, that if Rabin was not assassinated by 1999, we should have our independent Palestinian state. We have a real, genuine, brave partner for peace. But whoever came after Rabin was a complete disaster, no sense of understanding of history, and no sense of appreciating the reality of Israel, and no sense of concern about the security of Israel, the way Rabin thought about it, that not by breaking bones and not by military solutions, they can win the security of the individual Israelis. Israel has won or had won five major wars in the Middle East. But did Israel bring security to its own individual citizens? No. If I walk today in the streets of Jerusalem, today, and I pass through soldiers and whatever, if I put myself into the pocket, immediately I'm shot at point blank. Shoot to kill. These are the orders that this government has given the military personnel. Indiscriminate killing, and I see on the social media, and if you go into the social media and the YouTube, yesterday they arrested a five years old kid who wetted his pants when they caught him. He was trying to show them that he is going to throw stones at them. If you see in the social media, and actually Israel cannot deny these facts because, you know, people have smartphones, everybody is, you know, uh, 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 photographing or whatever <coughs> and documenting all these issues. It is a shame for a country like Israel that is considered to be the fourth strongest country in the world with an army like that being intimidated and being paranoid about a five years old kid who pretended that he would throw stones at them. Come on, come on. What's left, I mean? Well, this is the colonial settler mentality, and this is the way Israel perceives that controlling the geography and getting rid of the demography will solve the Palestinian-Israel conflict. I say, and tell me if I have to stop. Tell me if I have to stop. I say, I say, Israel has to realize several factors. Israel cannot continue to live in a siege mentality. 
It cannot continue to live in a garrison mentality. It cannot continue to live as a paria state. It cannot claim to be a democratic state in the Middle East while it is an occupying country. It cannot underestimate the demographer of Palestine in the year 2020 when we will be the majority Palestinians in Palestine. It cannot underestimate the factor that 1.8 billion Muslims are not going to sit idle and wait and watch what is happening in our religious sites. I cannot understand why the Christians in the world could sit idle and not do anything when 37 churches have been burned in Palestine in the last couple of years. I cannot understand to what extent America can really play the PR figure, okay, in protecting the Israelis. I cannot understand to what extent that the Russians and the Chinese are coming back as economic and political power and let this unipolar power control the international system. I cannot visualize Israel, you know, being in a, seed, in a sea of Arab and Muslim countries surrounded, you know, and sieged itself, you know, without any apprehensions and fears that one day Israel will not exist on the map. When do countries and people make concessions? They only make concessions when they are powerful and strong. This is the time where Israel have to realize that to make concession, to gain the state of Israel, to bring security to its own people, to become a full-fledged nation state in the Middle East, to have open relations with the Arab world as it was offered to them in the year 2002, the Arab summit in Beirut, you know, total trade relations with Israel, if Israel withdraws from the occupied territories, removing all kinds of boycotts against Israel. Imagine if Israel have accepted that in the year 2002, I wouldn't be surprised to see the flags of, Tel of, of uh, Israel in Tehran and in Mecca, Saudi. But you know, Abba Iban, this famous Israeli statement, he used to say that Palestinians and Arabs never miss an opportunity when they have an opportunity. I say, I'm not Abba Iban, and I don't claim to be a statesman like him, but I see Israel have missed many chances. Israel has to understand the reality. They cannot continue to fight 400 million Arabs, 1.8 billion Muslims, almost 8 million Palestinians who will be in the coming five or 10 years in Palestine and admit the fact that they can still defend the state of Israel. It is not the military power that will bring security and safety to Israel. It is the making of peace and us understanding that a painful on their side, which they consider painful, you know, and I hate the word concession, that an independent Palestinian state on 22% of historic Palestine with land swapping and exchanging of land will be the only security for the existence of the state of Israel. Without that, I cannot see any peace coming. Without that, I cannot see Israel settling down as an acceptable nation state in the Middle East. And without resolving the Palestinian issue, there will never be peace, stability, and security in the Middle East. We are going to still witness more conflicts, more wars, more bloodshed, more violence. I always say, the sooner the better. We live in such a small piece of land. If we don't coexist, we are doomed to die together. Thank you very much.
thank you very much for coming here and for giving us that insightful talk. We're going to open um, the discussion up to the floor. If you have any questions for Professor Hassafian, please raise your hand and a microphone um, will come up to you. And please keep your questions as brief as possible so we can go get as many questions as possible from the room. Will you allow Mr. Chairman to stand up? Yes, of course. Because I think it's easier to, to, to see no the students. No problem at all. Um, gentleman at the back. Yes. yes. Um, Raphael Levy, Queens. Um, I could point out a lot of sort of issues I have with your speech, um, a lot of the propaganda that I think you put forward, but it's pointless because you'd have responses for everything I have to say, and then we wouldn't get anywhere. Instead, I just want to ask, how do you think peace is possible when the entirety of your speech seems to be predicated on blaming one partner in this conflict and assigning no blame at all to the other? You repeatedly said that Israel needs to do this, Israel hasn't done this, Israel does that, Israel does this. And it seems very clear who you blame for this conflict. And I don't see how you can claim that Palestinians lack a partner for peace when the only side you ascribe any blame to, as is evident from your speech, is the state of Israel. Um, surely there needs to be a concession, a concession on your part in ascribing blame to the Palestinian leadership now in its 10th year of a four-year term um, and rather than just ascribing blame to Israel. Um, that's no way to, to achieve peace. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, comment. I know from where you are coming. One thing you should have a peace first in your mind personally, to understand that you cannot equate the victim with the victimizer. And you cannot, you cannot expect the victim to give concessions to the victimizers for the victimization process. You have to understand that we are under occupation and we have the legitimate right to defend ourselves and to get rid of this occupation. You're not talking about two countries, okay, on equal footing. So this blame game that you think it's only one-sided, this, you cannot sell this political discourse anymore. Because you understand that occupation is detrimental. And what occupation has done to the Palestinian people is also detrimental. The international community have seen exactly what Israel is doing with the Palestinians. Enough, my friend, 47 years of occupation. That has to end. And the way to end, you are talking to a diplomat who has understood the political realities. And I'm not here at the university to give propaganda speeches. I'm stating the facts, and those facts are being known at the, in the social media. We have to react when we are killed and maimed. We have the right to resist. So don't you ever put the victim and the victimizer on equal footing. Next question. Yes, gentleman in the front. Yes. Yes, um, I just had uh, two questions which are linked. The first one is you talked about a lot about uh, the fact that there are millions and billions of Muslims in the world. But the facts show today that Palestinians are quite alone in their issue and we don't see a lot of support from uh, the biggest Muslim countries. So I think, um, obviously, this is mainly a Palestinian issue and they have to deal with it by themselves. The other question is the Jewish, uh, the Jewish state, Israel, has uh, clearly decided its position in this conflict and Netanyahu is very clear about his policy. So my question is, what can be the next move of the Palestinians? Because the Israelis have decided. What can you do to bring peace and what concessions can you do? Because you talked about the Israeli concession, and obviously, unfortunately, the actual government is not ready to make a lot of them. So what can you do to yeah. improve the situation? Okay, you. you're welcome. The first question, it has always been a Palestinian issue. It is so unfortunate that the Arab and the Muslim world have always said in their rhetorical speeches that the problem of Palestine is the mother problems of all in the Middle East. And that a resolution to this conflict will bring stability and peace. 
I was not praising the Arab world, neither the Muslim world, on their position, as you can see. We have, the Palestinians, decided to embark on a peace process with Israel. We were not pushed by the Arabs or the Muslims to make peace with Israel. As a matter of fact, we have certain positions vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world and the Muslim world. Okay? So we never relied on the Arabs, neither on the Muslims. We are fighting our own battles on our own grounds, basically, to get rid of occupation. Secondly, what we get in terms of aid, all right, it has been more coming from Europe, the United States, and, and other countries. So we admit to the fact that what we get from the Arabs is pittance, basically. Now, I'm not concerned about the support of the Arabs if the Arabs cannot held themselves together, okay, and send an army to wipe the state of Israel. You know, they're not going to do it. They can't do it. They are impotent, totally reckless, divided, factorized, atomized. I have no hope. And that's why I was predicting the future, that this situation cannot prolong itself maybe 20 years down the pipeline. I'm trying to alert the state of Israel. Maybe I don't see the solution in my lifetime. I hope to see it in my grandchildren. But I'm trying to say the way to move forward is only through political accommodation. You know, peace should emanate from Israel and Palestinians sitting at a negotiating table. Not a single country in the world could really impose the solutions on us. So when the negotiations take place, and we agree we have to live up with those negotiations that would be legally binding. Now, the state of Palestine has been recognized, you know, so many times by the United Nations. Does this change the fact on the ground? Can my president, Mahmoud Abbas, cross from Ramallah to Jerusalem to go and pray in the Al-Aqsa Mosque? Definitely not. So whom are we kidding? We do understand the political realities, and we do understand our limitations in this conflict. We don't have Merkabas, we don't have Apaches, we don't have helicopters, we don't have, we don't have an army to fight Israel. Let's face it, we are under occupation. Five million people are every day, you know, suffering from this humiliation and desperation. What do you want men to do? That's number one. Number two, concerning the question of concessions, right? Listen, my friend. What more can the Palestinians give up when they have accepted the state of Israel over 78% of Palestine, right? What more can they give when Israel wants to share half of the West Bank territories and they want to call, you want to call it independence? Call it independence. But it is actually what Israel wants us. They want to render us as Indians living on reservations, collecting our garbage and minding our problems. They don't want a political solution to this conflict. They don't want to give us, you know, the Jordan Valley to be independent, you know, politically and have borders with, with Jordan. Israel wants us to succumb to the basic reality of power politics. And that is not going to happen, my friend. Because today, who is leading what we call the emerging intifada today? It's the, P it's, it's the youth that have been born after the Oslo peace process, who have seen nothing except settlements and killings and maiming and wars on Gaza and naked aggression. They are so desperate. This is not orchestrated, my friend, with my leadership or the PLO or the factions. These are instant reactions of youth who are desperate, who cannot take the humiliation of this occupation, who cannot see any kind of a sign of peace and, and tranquility and security to them in finding jobs, in having good educations or health and what have you. This is, you know, where Israel should realize you cannot continue boiling the pressure cooker. And the economic factor always ends up being the piston of any kind of a political or a violent reaction. You know it and I know it and it has been proven in the last two intifadas. Why this should be a completely different one. Thank you. Next question. Yes, gentleman at the back. I need to make a point here. I'm not trying here to score points, neither to debate for the sake of debate, to pin you down, 
or make any kind uh, of gestures that, you know, I look down at you and try to make you feel that you are inferior. We are here to educate ourselves. And I'm here to, to give you the other side of the story. I'm sure Cambridge Union Society have managed to bring many Israeli sides here. Okay? And I'm sure, and you have to be sure, that I don't have access to the mainstream media on BBC to go out and tell the true story. But Israelis have that privilege to do it, you know, through their means and propaganda. So please bear with me. I don't want to play this game of trying to impress you. I don't need to impress anybody here. I'm a distinguished professor with two PhDs. I'm well versed with my, with my knowledge and I know how to defend my people. Hi, uh, I'm very sympathetic uh, about the situation, but I want to get pragmatic, uh, realistic in this um, situation. For currently, you know that the Arab world is mostly uh, scattered and occupied in the existing conflict, and we do not see any world power participating in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, both, I would argue that EU, China, and Russia all do not want to venture into a boiling water. So, um, uh, is there? So, my first question would be: Is there any reasonable or practical, excuse me, reason that you can drag Israel willingly to the negotiation table and and basically uh, venture for a, a peace process? And secondly, um, without any, uh, well throughout all the entire uh, entire uh, well throughout your entire speech you uh, you you kind of rely on a sudden conversion of is Israeli policies to understand that a mutual existence is the only way but um, without such sudden conversion it seems that uh, uh, enough bloodshed is the only option and how can you expect a coexisting uh, existence of both countries after You know, uh, excuse me, maybe I didn't get exactly uh, the two questions, but I, I can have a sense of what you have said. I cannot force China and Russia and the EU, me as a Palestinian. I would love to see them involved in the, in the political process. I would love them to be part and parcel of this equation where there could be more parity between the negotiating parties to the conflict where I can see, you know, pressures being put on the Americans not to side with one against the other. And, and if everybody knows exactly what the stakes will be if this conflict continues forever and ever, I think, you know, by de facto, they should understand that they should be part and parcel, not of the problem, but of the solution to this problem. Now, we see the Russians today with Putin involved in Syria, this is a message to the United States of America, my friend. We see the Chinese are more and more becoming involved in the Middle East politically. This is another sign, you know, for the United States of America. And if you can't feel the rhetoric of the Cold War again on the international arena, then there is a problem. You have to understand that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict cannot really be alienated of all problems in the Middle East because it is the essence of all conflicts in the Middle East. Everybody knows that, but they are sometimes shy to admit it because they don't have the courage to face the United States. But for how long this shyness will continue, this is a question mark. And that's why, you know, I always say America is not going to continue to be the unipolar power. 20 years, 30 years down the pipeline, I think we have to change a major course in history. When it comes to the question of the conversion, I don't expect a sudden conversion from a right-wing fascist government. But you have to understand, my friend, this government is not going to last long in Israel. Because what it is doing, it is bringing destruction to its own people. You know, many Jewish Israelis are now on the streets complaining about the, the policies of their government in the occupied territories, are fear that, you know, they are fearful that the end result of this conflict will be com 
completely detrimental to their national ethos and to their presence in Israel. You think there are not voices in Israel? Maybe they are not heard as much, but there are voices of Israel who believe in a two-state solution, who believe that this kind of government cannot continue desecrating the holy sites and abusing the Palestinians with stringent extremist policies of cracking down on them. My friend, one thing which makes me really feel hopeful, not optimistic, but hopeful, is the fact that still people on both sides, and I would say 70% on both sides, are still for a two-state solution. They are still for a peace process. They are still for a certain kind of separation. And I'm not talking about unity after separation, because maybe that's a dream I have, to see a federated, a federated Palestine with Israel and that of Jordan. These are the realities that we have to be hopeful in the future. We cannot keep on stigmatizing our conflicts that we are stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. We have always to think that there are solutions to all kinds of problems in the world. And the sooner the better. And when you talk about a process of healing, my friend, look at South Africa, look at all the conflicts in the world where reconciliation and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission coming to the fact to address all these problems. Because, you know, after all, peace cannot be made by governments. It is made by people. And if we don't have people to people interaction to a process that inculcates peace and culture and the education of each other instead of the demonization process, there will never be peace, my friend. Never signing a peace agreement by governments will bring peace and tranquility to the peoples in conflict. We know it and Israel knows it. Palestinians and Israel know it, that they cannot continue this conflict forever and ever and ever. It has to end one day. And that day, that day will be when the occupying forces will move and redeploy their forces into the state of Israel and ending occupation. That is the time when I can see the prospects of peace, stability, and hopefulness in that part of the world. Thank you. Um, just a quick note on questions. Please keep your questions as brief as possible. Please wait for a microphone to reach you. This event is being live streamed. So if you don't speak into the microphone, it won't get picked up. And thirdly, please remember to ask only one question as part of your question so we can get through as many people as possible. Lady at the back. Hi. Um, what's your view of what, what voice do Christians have in Palestine and in the Middle East when we've seen continued persecution and a mass expulsion, really, of Christians and we're seeing the loss of a historic population? You mean in the Middle East or in Palestine? In Palestine and the broader Middle East. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your question. <coughs> First, I forgot to introduce myself. I think that should have been my first introduction. My name sounds to you Armenian. I am an Armenian by ethnic origin. And I'm a Christian and I'm a Catholic. I'm not a Muslim by religion and denomination. And I'm Palestinian by birth and citizenship. I was born in the old city of Jerusalem. I'm an Arab by nationality and definitely a Muslim by civilization. That's pluralism and that's how I was brought up. I'm a Christian who only is part of 1.5% of the population in Palestine. And here as a Christian, I represent Palestine in one of the most important countries in the world. If that tells you something, it tells you about our tolerance, about our pluralism, as a society as, and as Palestinians. Yes, the Palestinian Christians are targeted as the Muslims in Palestine. There is no difference between Christians and Muslims. Israel does not look at the difference in religion, in the way they persecute, in the way they occupy, in the way they take drastic measures, in the way they imprison you. There is no difference between Christian and Muslim. We are Palestinians. At the end of the day, we are Palestinians and we are the indigenous part of that part of the world, and we will stay there, 
and they, we will concert our efforts and we will put our hands together to get rid of occupation. Now, Israel has always tried to create a wedge between Palestinian Christians and Muslims. And I can't go into the details here to tell you exactly why, because we have, we have maybe to take other questions. But I will tell you, how could Israel be different than Daesh, who is killing Palestinians, who is killing Christians, who is killing Shiites, who is killing Muslims, Sunnis, you know? Killing is universal here. This is genocidal. It cannot really be accepted because all of us are human beings, regardless of our race, creed, religion. And there is no difference between Christian and the Muslim. And we all belong to the Abrahamic religions. I don't have any issues with Judaism. Judaism is our mother, Abrahamic religion. My problem is with occupation, my friends. Not with the Jews. My friend is with, my problem is occupation. I don't hate Jews. They are Semitic as much as I am Semitic. I don't have issues with Semitism and with, 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 with religious issues with that of Judaism. We have coexisted all along history. It's the Zionist ideology that really tarnished Judaism and ended up in a Zionist colonial settler movement. This is the ideology that I don't like and I would fight. But I will never fight Judaism as a religion because Christianity and Islam are complementing to Judaism and this should be made very clear. And please also make distinctions between Islam and Muslims. Islam is a religion of tolerance of acceptance, of unity. Muslims can use Islam as a facade for their own ulterior motives. I cannot identify with Daesh or the militant Islamic factions who use Islam just to justify their objective and their ulterior motives of politics. I will be siding with anybody who could fight, you know, this extremism that brought nothing except shame to Islam. And we cannot really continue to believe in the clash of civilizations like Huntington or Francis Fukuyama when he talked about the end of history, which means the end of tyranny and the reigning of democracy. We never have to think of clash of civilizations because our religions had brought us together. Maybe we differ in cultures. But never ever believe that our struggle with Israel has been a religious struggle. And I would really try to exonerate myself if that position really reaches when we are fighting each other on religious grounds. This is a secular conflict we're fighting for, for our independence, and we are fighting settler, colonial mentality, and we're not fighting religion here. So please, the distinctions should be made very, very, very clear. Thank you. Next question. Yes, lady in the front. Um, you talked about a crisis in leadership with Netanyahu. Um, and one of, the, one of the greatest reasons that Likud is um, constantly being elected is because of Israelis' fear. Israel? Fear. Their fear. fear. And Netanyahu constantly plays on that fear the fact that Israelis are terrified, um, for some reasons found and some reasons unfounded. Um, and until a preferable leader is elected, the peace process is damned. So how do you suggest that that fear is reduced or ameliorated? Well, I said in the beginning that, you know, fear has always been a major factor in molding, you know, the polarized positions on both sides. I, I don't deny that fact. But I think th there is a sense of insecurity inside Israel and inside the public at large that they think this is a phase that we want to have. And then, you know, eventually we will ask for more and more and more. This psychological mentality, I think nobody can really deal with it. 
We have been going outright. You know, I have been to every single university in, in Israel. I have been to every single think tank in Israel. I have debated Rabin. I have debated Perez. I have debated Barak. I have debated... The one who refuses to debate with me is Netanyahu. And I have seen how close we could get together to finding plausible solutions. We always try to touch the tip of the iceberg, okay? Something dramatic happens. Either a terrorist, a suicide bombing, or you see an Israeli military incursion. It is so unfortunate that the mainstream on both sides are dormant and not effective enough. It seems that the peripherals, who are the extremists, are the ones who are having the control of the fulcrum of the conflict. How can we gain back the power to the middle where mainstreams on both sides will call the shots rather than giving in to the hardcore on both sides? I say on both sides, all right? But I tell you, my president for the last 10 years, my friend, has always been there and opened his arms for peace. He was the only president who has military collaboration with Israel. What do you want more than that? He has been dubbed as a traitor. He has been dubbed as a quizzling. And he has been dubbed also from the Israelis as weak, ineffective, because he cannot control Hamas. What else can this Palestinian leader give the Israelis? And I don't want to give you many examples of how many soldiers were being astray in the West Bank. They were collected by our security forces and driven into safety. There are zillion incidents every day. Look at the West Bank the last 10 years. This is the first time now it's coming back into an intifada of desperation. And the collaboration Military call up till, my, up till this minute is still going on between Palestinians and Israelis. The question of fear has to emanate basically from the Israelis. What do they want? They want to constantly live in such fear. They want constantly to be psychologically, you know, under the effect of always, you know, Palestinians are there to kill them and, and to drive them into the sea. I mean, you know, they have to make up their mind. They want to live in peace and tranquility. They have to elect a government that is moderate to sit at the negotiating table. And we have sat at the negotiating table. Yes, we did not achieve. We were very close to achieving peace, but we did not achieve peace, which doesn't mean that we have to be helpless and pessimistic that there are no leaders in Israel who would sit at the negotiating table. No, there are. And the time will come. But why? Why should it come after bloodshed? This is my point. And if Israel is a democratic country, why people cannot voice, cannot voice their dissatisfaction with the, with the settlers who are controlling with impunity and they are being above international law in doing what they're doing in the occupied territories. Now, I'm not saying that there are no sharp critics from Israel, you know, criticizing the settlers. Yes, they are. There are also many professors who are on a, a touring streaks in, in the United States and here they talk about the ethnic cleansing, uh, about, the, about the settlements and about the occupation and what have you. Israelis themselves, revisionist historians who cannot continue to accept you know what Israel is doing as a democratic country. How can Israel be democratic and humanitarian and be abiding by the League, by the United Nations Charter of Human Rights while they are occupying another country and subjugating another people? This is, this is basically the essence, the essence of hypocrisy in history. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Any up by uh, Trinity College. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times what Palestine um, can do in order to um, promote peace and whether that's 
described as concessions or, or something else. Um, you mentioned briefly about the control of Hamas, and particularly the, um, the more militant wings of Hamas. Um, I, I, I'm sure that the vast majority of Palestinians do want peace, but obviously there are some sort of um, marginal, more extreme groups that don't, for example, the groups that may um, launch rocket attacks into Israel. Do you think that there's more that the Palestinian Authority can do um, to prevent these groups from um, partially undermining the peace process by giving Israel more cause to, um, uh, to justify its military actions? Well, first of all, I, I thank you for this uh, question, and my answer to you is very simple, my friend. If the peace process has succeeded, and if Israel had empowered President Abbas by releasing the fourth batch of the pre-Oslo prisoners, and if Israel has accepted a moratorium on the building of settlements, and if Israel wanted, basically, to go on with the peace process by having these two conditions being accepted, I think then the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah could take the lead in showing the people that, look, here are the dividends of peace. Now we are moving forward. Israel is resisting prisoners. Israel has halted settlements. Israel is willing back to go to the negotiating table. What does Israel do? It is disempowering President Abbas. It is disempowering the mainstream. It, is, it wants to continue nurturing conflict because it can justify its occupation policies by having extremists on the other side, be it Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Now, you know exactly what I'm trying to tell you. It is very important. Now, regardless, you know, these rockets, what they have done in terms of, uh, you know, we're discussing the principle not the effect of these rockets because, you know, the high military incursions with the high power machines of Israel, they destroyed Gaza twice, my friend, and they have killed thousands. So let's not compare the impact of the rockets. But symbolically, I can accept your argument. Yes, symbolically, I can accept your argument that, you know, these, whatever you call them, Hamas is a part and parcel of our fabric, of our social fabric. We cannot deny that they are not Palestinians. They are Palestinians whom they think, you know, resisting to occupation is the way out to get rid of the Israelis. That's, that's their idea, their mentality, their ideology. We tell them it's not through resistance, violent resistance, it's through peaceful resistance, it's through nonviolence, it's through political accommodations, it's through negotiations, it's through politics. We can come to an agreement. Because Israel wants us to play the hard game of a military conflict. Because they know they have the upper hand and they can crush us and they can control us at all times. This is our strategy today. To go to the International Court of Justice, to go to The Hague, to go to the United Nations, to ask for United Nations peaceful protection troops to come and protect us. In the, in the noble sanctuary, in the old city of Jerusalem. This is what we want. We don't want to escalate. We don't want to fight Israel because we're no match to Israel. We cannot fight and win a fight like that. The only way we can fight Israel through international law, through international humanitarian law, through the international organizations, and try as much as we can to be vociferous about our cause and to talk to the world that we are Palestinians are living in the longest occupation of modern history. That's our battle. That's our battle of war of images with Israel. And that's why we have to continue this method of nonviolence, peaceful resistance, talking, negotiations, and try to show the world that we, the Palestinians, we want peace regardless of Israel and its policies. In the final analysis, my friend, there were, there were wars that lasted for 300 and 500 years. Not a single occupier state. Eventually, they will be kicked out. We will never be the object of history. We will always be the subject of history. And time is on our side, believe it or not. With all the discrepancies of power politics, eventually, Palestinians will be liberated. Read my lips, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my grandson's lifetime. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. I just have a very f a quick few announcements to make. Tomorrow we will host our debating workshops. These are a fantastic opportunity for all of you to improve your debating skills, and if you've never debated before, learn from scratch. The people who coach you on our debating workshops are some of the best debaters in the country, and we'd really urge you to come here. Sorry, debating workshops on Wednesday, not Tuesday. Um, on Thursday, the union will host Jerry Springer. He will speak at the union at 5 p.m. on the topic of the inevitable trend towards liberalism and the American presidential election. Right after that, we will have the, a debate on the motion, This House Believes the American Dream is Colorblind, featuring Jesse Jackson. On Friday at 7 p.m., the union will host Christiane Amanpour. She is a very famous CNN journalist and is the journalist and a good friend of Professor Hassar Singh. <laughs> she is also the journalist that most politicians follow on Twitter and has various interesting uh, things to add to the debate on Julian Assange, on the Israel-Palestine issue and various other conflicts in the Middle East and beyond. So do come along if you are free. Um, thank you all so much for coming and thank you to Professor Hassar Singh for My coming pleasure. all the way My here. Thank you.